Greetings and salutations, all you lovely individuals. We are back here at League Unlock, Eric and Mark with you for the opening day kickoff to 2024 spring in the LCK. And of course, they've figured it out. They've mastered how to do scheduling. You say you we look at all 10 teams in the LCK. Hey, let's just tee up, chalk up a little Gen G versus T1 World Champions versus the three-time LCK champions. That's my sign that the schedule makers are also fans of the game. They got that passion when you can have that finger on the pulse and know who are the two teams more than anything that we got to see coming out of this offseason. Gen G, T1, and you get the head-to-head -head matchup day one. Let's go, LCK. And we know... T1 of all teams, the ones who like to spice up the meta a little bit and pretty much right away in game one, you got a little bit of that. You can, maybe it's a misclick, maybe it's not, but the dark technology coming right away because you got Guma buying the support item on Lucian and at least in the laning phase, uh, him and Curious Milio looked too far ahead, like didn't even make sense how far ahead they were and because he had this support item t1 gets five sweepers and are able to sneak an early baron yeah and that baron is exactly what gives them that advantage early on they pick up a, you know enough of that momentum enough of the gold around the map that they can withstand a little bit of that counter punch coming through from gen g around you know kind of in the river towards dragon but then it is all all about the boys on t1 getting it done and who's the big playmaker it is your man your boy in the mid lane baker the god coming through with the big nico stuff and i mean he had a couple flanks where he gets the three man nico alti we know this guy is obviously uh very comfortable and excels on a guy where he gets the go button as t1 does take that first game in pretty convincing fashion i would say even though it was a low kill game uh throughout so we head into that second game after the corky in game one Chovy was just feeling 80 carries today. He said, guys, I don't really want to play the game. I just want to AFK farm and kill some turrets. And let me tell you, he was doing a whole lot of that in game two on the Tristana. Tristana is a pretty darn a premium champion to be into that type of mindset for a player like Chovy. And it is instantly the advantages, the goal being built up by this Gen G squad, slowly but surely taking their advantages in this game too. I got to be looking at it as even though you have quite a nice little nifty footwork for Mr. Zeus up at the top side on the Udyr to make Ooh. sure he's picking up that first blood. I didn't see that Udyr be all that effective later on. And I think that's a trend that I will talk about with some of these early champion, early looks at the meta and the champions. Uh, but other than that, you see a big, big play. I want to highlight it by Keen towards the T1 base. He makes sure that Cassante alt is heading straight for the Nyla. The Nyla, Guma's Nyla that was going for a three-man ultimate could have been the one that changes the complexion of this game, stalls it out for T1. Not happening on Keen's watch Gen G, making sure it's a tied game in the series. Again, already cooking early for T1. I know we've seen the Nyla send a bot lane out of them before, but they're just, they're throwing everything at the wall in this new season 14 craziness with items. And it worked pretty well for them, but of course, Pays was still an absolute uh, lethal Varus in the bot lane and Chovy, as we mentioned, was just destroying turrets the entire time. He ended up picking up the player of the game honors in that second game. Then, of course, we are delivered to the third game because T1 Gen G always live up to the hype. Although this third one looked like it was going to be over before the game started because left, right and center Gen G was just picking off T1 members one by one to the tune of, I think they got up to an 8k gold lead at one point pretty early on. Yeah, 6, 8k gold. Enough of an advantage that you know that that wallet payback is coming back against T1. But you got to be careful. T1, we know against Gen G of all squads, they love to take a Baron. And yes, that is your man, the myth, the legend, <sighs> owner on a Belveth, swooping on in to steal it and keep T1 in this match. And they're even trying, it at least looks like, to do everything to prevent him from blast coning over, but he somehow ends up getting in uh, and gets that steal. But even before that, Kudos to T1. They had no business even being alive still to be able to contest that Baron. It felt like this game should have snowballed out of control 
way earlier. You had Curious denying Hextech Soul early on a Bard somehow. Not sure how that happened. Then that Baron Steel. It was basically just one objective stolen by owner to get T1 back into this game to the point. And then they're defending in the base even against an Elder Dragon. It felt like this game took 15 minutes longer than it should have for Genji to close this out. It, it, it felt like it, and it was. That's that's really the end of the story, is that it is a game where you didn't have the advantages. You had your lead as Genji. You should have, against almost every other organization, closed this one out. A team like T1 can make the imp impossible happen off of one play. That's the type of scenario that you got. And I says, as you mentioned, that fight in, in the base, holding it off against Elder Dragon with a Jin that's basically a WE bot at this point, that is crazy to me looking at what was going on for T1. Of course, it's not enough though. Genji gets the decisive team fight and find their way through to take the series. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, Guma's Jin ended up doing less damage than Canyon's Maokai in this one. And it was the Udir picking up a win for Keen, even though he didn't have a huge amount of impact. Uh, Pays finishes the game with 12 kills, continuing at least one series in, absolutely zero signs of a sophomore slump. No, no signs of it from Mr. Pays. He is making sure that he is gonna be that superstar development for this Gen G team, continuing it on, keeping it on track. I think you can look even, uh, you know, throughout this first, the, through the whole series, you know, maybe outside of that first game where nothing really got going, no momentum. You look in that second game, continued into the third one. Pays is an elite damage threat in the LCK, and he's showing that's gonna continue into the sophomore season. And Genji continues to have T1's number. They'd be thankful that they don't match up against them at Worlds ever, because Genji maybe chokes against someone else. But a full year now, 365 days plus since T1 has beaten Genji in the LCK. I think it's going to, um, you know, necessitate some action from T1 to prepare to be more focused towards this ultimate challenger, ultimate rival in the LCK. You know, there's still going to be. Of course, the other top level teams that were waiting to see the matchups and feel out their power level and everything else. But for T1, this is that, you know, repeat run trying to go again for another world championship title. A, you know, a contender like Gen G is going to be in your way, regardless whether it's at that international events, MSI, or the world championship, or it's going to be here in the LCK spring and summer. You're going to have that challenge. Can't wait to see how T1 adapts and tries to pick themselves back up after this. And, I mean, a great debut for Gen G with three new members coming in this year. And, unfortunately, now we got to listen to the stat that Canyon is 2-0. Every single one of Gen G's wins are coming with him on Maokai. Uh, not what I was thinking when Canyon was heading over there. But you got a guy like Chovy. You got a ADC like Pace. Pretty easy to make the argument to your boy in the jungle to say maybe we need a little bit of that tree action from the Maokai. I, I think that when you're looking at this from the Gen G perspective, as you laid out the three newcomers, all good, all mostly check marks across the board. I think you have a little slip up here or there, of course. You know, the Zeus outplay on the Udir one you can look at with Keen, but all of them make big moments, big type of plays to make sure that it is Gen G going across the finish line. And it's always hard to call most Udir plays an outplay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, he played it well, got that first blood. That's just the world that we're in. It's looking like we might be heading into an Udir infested meta. Look no further than the matchup that was before Gen GT1, Nongshim DRX. And this was Udir in both of these games having even less impact than uh, what we saw out of T1 Gen G. Listen, he's insanely tanky, a lot to deal with, but other than stunning every few seconds, does he really do that much in team fights? The answer is no. The answer is I don't know from what we have seen so far. Udir is not doing that. He's not having that effect. As you laid out, very tanky. And he's very tanky for quite a while of the game until a very certain point. You kind of get around, you know, past 30 minutes or so, and you've got mega damage options available for a lot of these big time lethal threats on the enemy team, even on your team. And you can see that damage popping through in Udir later on. And then you get the scenario where what we saw a lot in this series uh, from the two top laners of the Udyr just basically taking a lot of damage and saying, I got to get out of here and skedaddling out of the fight. And then the enemy team goes, OK, there goes the Udyr. Let's go keep pushing towards the base. 
I mean, he does kind of seem like the perfect target dummy because uh, didn't, did, you know, he ended up picking up player of the game on that Udyr pick in the second one. But the big surprise here is early on in game one, I was getting excited about the rookies on DRX, Teddy and Rascal as the veterans. I was getting hyped. And then they proceed to lose 2-0 to Nanshim, who I was maybe expecting to win two series all split long. And here they are 2-0ing in their very first matchup. And I think individually, you can look at someone, you know, on, on the DRX side like Teddy, and you can see, you know, relatively strong performance doing a lot of the right things. And, and even in that first game, I'll lay it out right here. Lucian across LEC and LCK, one and seven right now. And that Lucian from Teddy is one of those seven losses and is the only Lucian that I've seen look any bit lethal with the damage that he was able to offer. Another one of those, you know, early adaptations in the meta were tracked. But you saw, as soon as it was hitting late game, an Aphelios with a Milio hits a whole lot different than Lucian, even when he's paired with a Nami. Yeah, and there's nothing that was able to contest at that point, uh, especially with, again, that Milio. Another thing, that another mention with that type of champion, and I think the way that he has evolved and kind of really cemented himself as one of these options in the meta quite quickly uh, for these ADCs, what he provides, what he offers, and for 200 years, champion design, like Aphelios that can take it to that maximum level, you give him a little bit of that extra campfire friendly boost from your man Milio, it's going to be done done. <laughs> it absolutely uh, was in both of these games because he got Milio in both of those. Uh, but we'll see DRX if they can, you know, not that there was hyper expectations really, but maybe bubbling up towards a playoff spot or maybe it's the resurgent Nong Shim split for them, but again, only one game, so not too much to be overreacting about. You could be overreacting about nine LCK teams, not ten, nine teams writing a formal letter to Riot Games, basically saying, listen, franchising's been around for a couple of years, viewership numbers have continued to trend upwards, the LCK is pretty much the premier league in all of the competitive esports space for League of Legends, but they feel like they are not getting enough support, resources, or trickle-down effect in terms of, you know, money talks. So they're mad at Big Papa Riot because they're not getting enough help or cut from all the success that Riot's getting. Yeah, th there's more to it, and I think even myself, I need to take some more time to fully, you know, vet through and look through what is going on and what they're asking for. But really, at the end of the day, it comes down to an equation from these nine LCK teams recognizing and realizing that the game of League of Legends has grown, the professional esports scene, the interest, the viewership, it's all growing. All these type of things, and we're not seeing that return on investment down to us type of situation of it all being shared out. And as these contributing partners, they feel like what they're putting up is not going to be matched here by Ryan. So they want that to be changed. There's ab ab absolutely an argument I think that can be made for it in the LCK, and especially even this year, fresh off it, you know, whether it's the LEC or the LCK, we're smashing viewership records. So absolutely, there's something to this that the LC LCK teams can talk about. The one thing against it is, of course, well, number one, the report comes out that it's 10 teams. It's not 10 teams. It is very quickly changed to nine teams, corrected by Mr. Joe Marsh of T1. Yes, T1, the biggest, most important team in the LCK are not part of this one. And I think it's an important one because you look at what T1 is involved in the LCK at the very top level, at the challenger level, there is a massive investment into this one. And if they're saying we're okay with the returns coming back still from Riot, despite the growth of the game, despite the growth of the eSport in general, that's a tough argument for me. Well, I, some of the biggest points that I think a lot of these teams, they want uh, more revenue sharing. They feel like the LCK plays less games. Uh, or I think they're comparing to professional sports more than esports, that they want more games. They want more uh, functionality in the client to improve training, all these things. A lot of these things, T1 goes, I mean, we play all these Extra games with Red Bull events in the offseason. We're making so much money off of world skins, probably. Obviously, T1 is going to be the most profitable team in the entire LCK, I imagine, by a wide margin. So it's not surprising at all that they're the only team not signing this letter. No, but it's also one of the teams that does have probably the higher operating costs around the LCK. You look at what it takes to operate the facilities, of course, how invested they are 
in that challenger scene and bringing through new talent, developing it, keeping an eye, scouting, all these type of things. Of course, it's a lot. And at the end of the day, as you also mentioned, with that focus towards, you know, uh, traditional sports and that comparison, you do look at traditional sports and there is a lot more of these agreements, arrangements with the leagues as far as how the revenue is going to be shared and whether, if you know, look, if the league's doing better, these numbers change to this, all those type of things. So that absolutely is a precedent set within traditional sports to try and make this more of a thing. And I think when you're looking at the nine LCK teams and we talk about the numbers, even with a, a big major holdout like T1, you've got to think there's going to be some traction here for these teams in negotiating. And a lot of the, I think, issues raised in this letter is an industry-wide issue in esports. And it all, the biggest thing still to me boils down to, well, watching for free. You go on Twitch, you're on YouTube, you're watching for free. Yeah, you can support your individual team. You can buy merch, you can do whatever. But the model of paying for cable or streaming services to watch traditional sports doesn't apply to esports. There's got to be some type of way to find that monetization. I, I think that has been a long-standing issue. One of the ones that we've definitely talked about throughout the course of the LCS and the LCS is viewership issues and how you try to bring in new viewers, how you offer them a different product, all these types Jersey of things. Jersey mics, that's the solution. Uh, the solution could be Jersey mics and the State Farm Analyst Desk and Amazon, you know, whatever type of corporate plug that we're not getting money for for talking about on this show. Or you can do things like I think in the past and one of the things that we've talked about Stuff like ProView. How about implementing that into one where, okay, you subscribe to the YouTube or the Twitch channel for the LCS. Now you get access to the ProView of, you know, these players for the games or whatever type of things. You got to offer additional features, additional, you know, substantial offers to the fan bases for that extra money. But that is a missed out market and opportunity massively by eSports. And do you want to talk? viewership the lck week one was fantastic t1 being the biggest draw now it's t1 challenger also smashing records reckless's debut with the squad it was a hundred thousand more peak viewers than we're accustomed to seeing in the challenger scene in week one i knew it would have an impact but i didn't even think it'd be this big I didn't think it'd be this big. I didn't think that we'd have an impact in game, in the second game right away. The correction of get that man off of the center. He's too good on these type of champions is the reaction coming through. There's one thing to talk about, you know, what kind of two things to really go through here. Number one, as you mentioned, the viewership numbers. Yes, that is instantly that reaction from Reckless, that extra attention that people want to be seeing what he's going to be doing on this roster as well as I think you could be looking at uh, Griffin is another name that a lot of people want to see what he's going to be doing. And even Poby, our man Poby, the GOAT in the mid lane, people want to check in on him. And when we do check in on him and see how these games went, I think overall a decent level of strength coming through from T1, but certainly one where you could maybe question how they didn't come away from this series with those two wins. Can we get the hype? For the LCS, we got the teaser video for the 2024 Spring Split. Always a decent amount of, I'm going to say cringe for a lot of these <laughs> LCS teasers, but this one was fun. It's lighthearted. The last few teasers have all kind of been more jokey. The LCS kind of embracing that meme region, and this is just another example. Yeah, embracing a, a bit of the memes, a bit of the heat that comes through, and of course, never quite as cringy as some of the LEC content that comes through. I love the LEC, and I love some of that content that comes through, but you better believe they're taking some swings and misses on some of those ones. The LCS a little bit more conservative. I, I'm, I'm not buying into the whole Hollywood aspect going through in this hype trailer, but it is a, a relatively solid one, and absolutely one that I think is gonna get these new you know, people that are tuning in, or maybe someone that hasn't paid all attention through the off season it's going to give you a little bit of a fresh dose of hey there's a new face or hey there's a, there's a face i know in a new place type of thing so that's absolutely getting the job done for the intro video uh, young man sniper already making it into the teaser video before he's even played a single lcs game let's go nice recognizing we got a developing a future star in the league let's get him into some of this content let's do it yeah, it's, I was already kind of hyped for, even though LCS down to eight, there's a lot of bad publicity around it. Some of the changes that are coming in, already excited for the season, regardless of what the teaser video is. 
We know there's fearless draft going on in the challenger scene. Now some spicy changes in the BCS in a best of three or best of five in the final games. Instead of doing a boring old coin flip for if you're red or blue side, throw on some chilies onto this one because they're going to have 1v1 showdowns to determine side selection. The one thing I got to ask is, do you put a guy on your roster who's just a 1v1 specialist now? What is a 1v1 specialist now? Is that a guy that is just a hard, hardcore one trick? That's his thing and he knows it inside out all the way through? Or you got a guy who's got the champion ocean of oceans all across the world and continents reaching through in every type of pick he's available for. This is crazy and I love it because again, it is one of these ways to push it, change things up, add that spice. And especially in a situation, tied best of three, tied best of five, Everybody knows it's the lamest and, and worst feeling option to just do a coin flip. Even if you win the coin flip, you're not feeling all that great about picking that side because of that situation. Now, it's got a little bit more heat to it, a little bit more deciding, a little bit more actual raw gameplay from the people. Love that when we get that involved. We're going to be hearing about the shy signing with the BCS squad <laughs> as the mercenary 1v1 sixth sub. He doesn't even play actually on the rift. He can just stick to that ARAM map. I wonder if this is going to breed a new era of VCS players that are forged in the flames of having to be able to go 1v1 for that all important side selection. It's going to be something different, something fresh, and something spicy. We love to see those type of decisions coming through to shake up the changes they're gonna be having two scrim blocks and then a 1v1 <laughs> block to close out training every single day over in vietnam it reminds me of you know of course you know i'm wondering what they're going to be doing is it 1v1 in the howling abyss just 1v1 straight down mid lane is it going to be 1v1 in the mundo dodgeball baron pit you know what type of layout are we going with that and then it just reminds me of the old type of memes talking about fighting, you know, the T1 SKT members having to beat Coma in a 1v1 <laughs> type of situation. You love to see it. You love to hear about it. The true final boss starts before game five even gets going on the rift. But that is it today for League Unlock. Mark and Eric, except reverse that, here with you guys <laughs> on League Unlock. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll catch you on the flippity flip.